Awesome. All right. Thank you very much for having me. So I'm Rashina. I am from Monash University in Melbourne. Um, and it's my pleasure to talk to you today about uh, this topic, which is you asked for it, making sense of user feedback. So as I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which I present, which is the Wurundjeri and the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. And I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and to everybody who is here and joining us online from various lands around the world. Okay, so I'm going to start with something that might be a little bit of a controversial statement in all my research on Agile and working with Agile for a really long time. I think user stories are a modern agile myth. Why do I say that? Basically, if you really think about it, user stories are made up stories about what we as software developers and software stakeholders think the users want. They're based on assumptions. So the best assumptions we can make about the users, they are led by convenience because, uh, well, we're here and oftentimes the users are not. And the stories are obviously not real. These are situations that we think up of users actually using our system in advance. So this leaves the kind of everyday average user thinking, as a user, I want to provide my own feedback so that customers don't have to pretend to know what I need. Real user stories, on the other hand, are priceless. So they're an important source of identifying things like bugs, usability issues, as well as new feature ideas. Because what really matters is the fact that even though customers are the ones paying for the development of the product, but it is the users that decide the fate of the product. So the real user stories will tell us things like their needs. So the needs of the users, and this is needs of users that are diverse. And when we understand that diversity, it can lead us to building products that are more generalizable across the human population around the world. It also leads us to understanding human wants in terms of our preferences, things we like, we don't like, and that can lead us to software teams personalizing and customizing their solutions, um, and which kind of you know, leads to users coming back to their favorite products because of that personalization aspect. Real user stories are also an important source for generating business value, because when users see their feedback being actioned upon, that builds trust, loyalty, and the reputation of the brand, which ultimately leads to things like sales and profits. Now, how do we get to these real user stories if we don't want to make them up? So we can get all sorts of real user stories or real feed user feedback from things like user ratings, reviews on app stores, feedback through websites, complaints through call centers. And these are the kinds of stories that I call proactive stories because the user has volunteered to give it to you even though you may not have asked for it. Then there are the automatic stories. So these are things like activity logs being logged at the back, user likes, dislikes, and engagement, and demographics, all of it being accumulated in the background without the user actually even finding out. The other ones are prompted user stories in that the apps might be prompting people for their ratings or reviews. And finally, there is this idea of elicited stories, which is where we purposefully collect user feedback through these intentionally designed activities like co-design sessions, user experience sessions, focus groups, observations, interviews, think aloud, beta testing, all of these. So what are we really dealing with here? What we're dealing with is if you kind of look across all of these kind of real user stories, we find something common, which is all of these reviews and feedback forms and complaints and characteristics and da da da. Well, all of these are really qualitative data. In fact, a majority of it is qualitative data. So it goes from everything large scale, so, so hundreds and thousands of reviews, to more small scale because you know, you'd know you probably be you're doing about tens or 20 of uh, focus groups rather than thousands of them. But ultimately, they're all qualitative data. Now, here's the other fact, which is we usually don't want to deal with real user feedback. And the question is why? So. Some of the reasons are, well, there's lots of it, 
The other is because it's qualitative, it's usually unstructured and it's messy and it's hard work to try and really get your head around what all of this means altogether. So current approaches, and I'm not expecting you to read and understand the whole of this diagram, but you can do, you know, look at it in that paper from the empirical software engineering last year that goes into the details of the steps. But what I'll highlight here, they're currently the current approaches usually include two steps. So one is the automated analysis, which there are automated tools, which will filter noise, it applies synonyms, and then it classifies based on keywords that you provided. And second step is manual analysis of qualitative data using the sample reviews that you have. So what I'm going to propose is going to be helping with the second part. Now, current limitations of this approach is while this approach helps us answer things like the what and the how, it really doesn't help us answer the whys. So that in-depth you know, idea is missing. Also, because we, it is keyword based, if we focus on bugs, we'll find bugs, but we'll miss the proverbial butterflies in that there are all sorts of interesting findings in there, but because we were not looking for them, we never find them. However, because it's all publicly available data, our competitors can find these butterflies and they can act upon it to improve their product, even if we are not doing it. So here comes socio-technical grounded theory or SDGT as a powerful qualitative data analysis method. So given the time limit, I'm going to show you a very quick example of what open coding in SDGD looks like. And what I'll ask you to think about is really the idea of hashtags, uh, especially if you are a social media user like Twitter, you will be very familiar with the idea of hashtags that are used to capture, you know, very profound ideas in a few words. So here's a user review that we're looking at right now. Now, if we were looking, using a keyword-based approach, if we, we were looking for the word scam, sure enough, it's right there, we'll find it. And then we can report it and that's okay. But we are going to miss all of this other, as I said, all of these butterflies, these interesting findings that we were not looking for. If we use open coding using social technical grounded theory, we actually have a chance at finding out all of these other interesting ideas. So to give an example, a bit in the blue, I would code this as hashtag unintentional upgrade, because here the user is talking about how unintentionally they were led to upgrading to a $99 pro version because their fingerprint was set in the app store. The other part which you see in the gray is all their attempts to come and to contact with the company using the various channels that are available. So I would have, you know, kind of code that as hashtag multiple contact channels, which do exist, but then the other code there is hashtag no customer service. So even though there are multiple channels, there was no customer service provided. Now, all of this, the fact that it's a review or usually comes with a rating. So at the bottom, we see that it's a one star out of five stars, so hashtag for review. In other words, all of this come together makes up a cohesive story about the fact that this is a frustrated customer who just didn't like the product. It was a scam in their opinion and in their experience. And there were a couple of other interesting things that we found on top of the fact that we just classified it as scam. Now, how do you scale this? So I'm gonna show you, you know, how we go from raw data to these idea of codes and then group codes together to come up with concepts. So here, for example, uh, a review said, app requires you to have location services always on, which is coded as hashtag forced location sharing. The other is you have no option but to give them consent to sell your data to third party. And this is forced consent to policy. And the third one is my account got hacked and another phone was registered. And that would be like obviously hatched, hacked um, account. If we look at all these codes all together and we constantly compare them and take it to the next level of abstraction and group them together, we're talking essentially about this idea of privacy issues. So remember, we started off looking for scams, but we also found privacy issues because we were using an open approach. So if you use a social technical grounded theory for qualitative data analysis, you're gonna be able to systematically analyze data for individual classifications, but also for data-wide you know, patterns that you can find. It can lead to rich insights and guidelines and recommendations, for example, on improving privacy in this case. But for those of you who are more interested in 
uh, coming up with research outputs as well. Say, for example, you're a user experience uh, research team within a company. Um, you can use this in a more rigorous application to develop taxonomies, theoretical models, and theories, which you can then report in peer-reviewed journals. So the new approach that we're talking about is making sense of real user stories using SDGT, where you still have those two steps, but instead of being linear, it's iterative for one thing. And also because of the fact that we're using open coding in the second step using soft uh, socio-technical grounded theory, we're able to find new and refined keywords that feed back into the automated analysis and goes back and forth. And this allows you to achieve both depth and breadth in your analysis of uh, user feedback. So the benefit for user software teams is that now you can really work with smaller classified piles of user feedback uh, that can be neatly put under different labels. It will lead to, lead to richer analysis to draw out interesting findings. So you catch all the bugs that you were looking for, but you also don't miss the butterflies. The benefit for users, of course, is it increases their confidence in updating apps. They give you better ratings. And benefit for um, companies, of course, as we saw before, is because you're actioning the user feedback, it increases the trust and therefore increases sales. And I'm going to end with this, which is if you want to find out more, you can use this QR code and or type in my website and there you'll find the actual key paper that talks about the guidelines. There are also a couple of videos on technical briefing. But if you're coming to XC in 2023 in Melbourne, we'll love to welcome you. But I'm also giving a technical briefing on social technical grounded theory there. And there's an upcoming book. And very quickly, I'd love to thank Dr. Omar Hagag, who helped me with this, and Michael Hoy. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Rashina. If you'd like to end your screen share, we do have one question coming in. Um, one of our viewers would like to know, are there any special concerns or risks here with confidentiality, with loss of privacy and so forth in doing this kind of analysis compared to, for example, the conventional web metrics? Uh -huh. So, um... What I'll say there is that um, we are in this instance dealing with data that is already publicly available. So people have chosen to uh, share that online um, and it's already in the public realm. Um, we also use social technical grounded theory for more confidential research wherein you're doing interviews and so on. And in that case, what you would do is you will um, try to de-identify the data in that you would remove all of the details that would could be potentially identifying either the company or the individual or any of those things. But you can still analyze it to find the key issues and the key problems. 